in he said he'd reveal what's to come the thoughts in his mind always higher than mine reveal all to come so take courage my heart stay steadfast my soul he's in the way
you're doing a great work maybe it's the first time some people have said words like this that we're willing to be challenged that we're willing to go places that you haven't asked us to before but all I can think about is I just want to be where you are Jesus I'm, I want to go where you're going to meet me and I think as a group that's the longing and Lord if it's not for some quite yet that you start that stir that anywhere without you is 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 void of any kind of love or joy but it's in your very presence that we are made complete and we find your ultimate rest even if it's at the very edge lord jesus take us there that's where we want to go 
We thank you for this time, Jesus, in your name. Amen. Thanks, Joe. Am I just going to stay up here, huh? Yeah. Go right into it. I think I just want to pray again. <laughs> That's okay. Just aligning our hearts together and, and this time. Oh, I just want it to be about him. So if you'll pray with me. Lord Jesus, we call on your name. Your powerful name that permeates all of our lives. That you heal the spots that are wounded. And you wash over the spots that needed forgiven. Thank you for the way that you've made us white as snow. And you bring purity upon our lips and our thoughts and our hearts. And you create space. Some of us may have came in pretty heavy and pretty clouded with the day and the tasks and just the heaviness of life. But that you create space in us. May you go into our hearts and check every room, prepare it for what you have in store through this time together. And Lord, that you may be edified and glorified. Please, Lord, use me as your vessel and have your way in my life as well, Jesus. In your name, amen. Well, I've been pretty excited, just been excited. You can ask friends that I've been talking to about this, and that's the words that keep coming out of my mouth. I'm just really excited. <laughs> I didn't have a lot of other things to say about it, just that my heart was full. I don't know that I'm necessarily good at this. I don't think it's a matter of finding your talents and using them, I think it's more about the willing heart. And I think that where the Lord's been leading me for some time has been a time for this. And so thank you again for having me and just hearing where I've been at in my life for some time and, and where I think he wants us all to go. This message is for all, for wherever you're at. Um, we're going to start right in, actually, with a passage that I want to read, Joshua 1, 1 through 9. If you have your Bible, it'd be great if you could open it and read along. If not, you can see right in front of you that we've laid some booklets so you can take notes. So that would be really great, and I encourage you guys to do that. Joshua 1, 1 through 9. We're going to get a little history th moment that happens, and then some really powerful words that are handed to us. After the death of Moses, the servant of the Lord, the Lord said to Joshua, son of Nun, Moses' aid, Moses, my servant, is dead. Now then, you and all these people get ready to cross the Jordan River into the land I'm about to give to them, to the Israelites. I will give you every place wherever you set your foot, as I promised Moses. Your territory will extend from the desert to Lebanon and from the great river to the Euphrates, all the Hittite country, to the great sea of the west. No one will be able to stand up against you all the days of your life. As I was with Moses, so I will be with you. I will never leave you nor forsake you. How many of you have ever clung to that, those words? <laughs> many of us. Before I go into this next part, I just want to say, was this not a huge uptaking? Moses. Moses. We saw him throughout scripture. Joshua walking with him saw the miracles that poured out of him and the way God repeatedly used him. And him. So much power reigned in this man's life and now he's dead. And I think people were getting a little shaken. I mean, the Israelites already struggled with being obedient children and keeping their faith up. Remember the time with the golden calf? <laughs> hey, you just were flee from slavery. We're tired of waiting on God. Let's go build a golden calf. I mean, this was, this was a pattern of theirs. So for Moses to die, I'm sure just shook their boat like crazy. But here, Joshua, the willing vessel, the one so ready to take action. These are the words that God gave to Joshua. Be strong and courageous. 
because you will lead these people to inherit the land I swore to their forefathers to give them. Be strong and very courageous. Be careful to obey all the law my servant Moses gave you. Do not turn from it to the right or to the left, that you may be successful wherever you go. Do not let this book of the law depart from your mouth. Meditate on it day and night, so that you may be careful to do everything written in it. Then you will be prosperous and successful. Have I not commanded you? Be strong and courageous. Do not be terrified. Do not be discouraged. For the Lord your God will be with you wherever you go. And in that very minute, right after hearing God's voice, Joshua then took action, set to his call, and got the people in order. A response of obedience and love. One of the reasons I love this so much is because you right away see that there's relationship. See, we have a hard time in the Old Testament. We see a lot of do's and don'ts, don't we? But then in the New Testament, we see Jesus, our relationship, our, our intimate one we walk with. He walks with me. He talks with me. This personal thing we have. But it was in the Old Testament right here, so much love from Joshua. It wasn't just obey because I'm scared of you, God. <laughs> might be part of it, but it was love. It was the love of response to immediately see the people through. So much care for them, so much courage it took right off the bat. I kind of want to hop right into some stories of inspiration that I know have changed my life and continue to change my life <laughs> yearly, daily. <laughs> We've recently, some of us had the opportunity to go out to uh, North Mahaska School to hear a a retelling or an enactment from Corey Ten Boom. Are all of you familiar with the story of Corey Ten Boom, The Hiding Place? Yes. Um, I read the story when I was about 13 years old and it changed my life. I think I was given perspective that people live differently than me. Whether it was history or another part of the world, my life thought, oh, there's something different. Um, in Corey's story, I think, I think my favorite part is that there's a change of perspective that happens to her. We're given the commandment to praise God in all things. We're given, we're given suggestions of to be thankful for all of our stuff. But how many of you have been in a moment, in that very moment of pain and frustration and utter ugliness, and chose a thankful heart? Usually we say no, don't we? Usually we say, I don't want this. Take it from me. This can't be God because it's not good. Now, Patty challenged us last night, didn't she? She said right away, oh, this is the Lord's will. This is what he has. This is what he has for us. If we could turn our hearts like that every time, if that response could be that of love, like Joshua. So here in Corey's story, which is very relational as well with her sister, Betsy. So Corey and Betsy were Christians hiding Jews at the time during the Holocaust. And... Um, they were both taken into, into imprisonment, into the concentration camps. Well, it was during that time that there was many challenges, many struggles, but many miracles that the Lord kept revealing, this is where I have you. This is my will. Nothing else will do. I don't want you back at the other house, Corey and Betsy. I don't want you back where you were with hiding the Jews or the time before when you sat around the table with your father. It's here and now in the struggle and in the trial. It's through this that I want to use you. That was hard for Corey, but a lot easier for Betsy, <laughs> her sister. So it was a situation where, as many as you know, in the concentration camp, they were overpacked in their bunks. There would be six women or so lined up in, in one small bunk in their bunk beds. Many of them, or all of them had at that point, had lice and fleas. It was just a terrible, terribly uncomfortable situation. And... Um, there was just a lot of frustration coming from Corey. She felt a little abandoned, I think, at that moment. She felt a little maybe forgotten, or maybe God wasn't being very careful with her. And Betsy said, no, take perspective. Change your thoughts and view this differently. We're going to thank him for the fleas, and we're going to praise him. We're going to praise him for the lice and the fleas. And oh my goodness, the frustration that stirred in her. I mean, can you have, could you have done this? You get bit like just once by something. Could you imagine how irritated you get? You get stung by a bee. You know, those little stings in our lives, what rises up in us is kind of shocking, isn't it? A lot of times it's anger. A lot of times it's, um, 
I don't know, ugly? It's just plain ugly? I think that was Corey. Some things were stirring her that weren't so attractive. But Betsy said, we'll praise him. That's what we've been asked to do. That's what he asks us to do. So then uh, the sergeants and the leaders had stopped coming to their bunks because of the fleas and the lice. And they were able to have Bible study after Bible study and times of praise and worship in their bunk because the, the officials weren't coming by anymore. And she said, see, see, Betsy showed her. She said, look at the perspective. Look how he blessed us with the fleas and the lice. They would have been coming around. They would have found our Bible. They would have stopped this and put it to a halt. And here was that, that perspective, that shift. And I just, if we could take that up a little bit. You know, receiving courage isn't about becoming stronger within oneself or shaping ourselves into an image that the world would deem courageous or brave. Right now, the enemy is on the loose. He's seeking to destroy and rob created whatever is good. The number one right now that I, I think is our identity and who we are and who he is. If we truly believe as women of God that our identity is found in Christ alone, then we wouldn't be striving and clinging to most of the things that we fill our lives with. I'm going to say that again. <laughs> if we truly believe as women of God that our identity is found in Christ alone, then we wouldn't be striving and clinging to most of the things that we fill our lives with. The number one distraction is our very comfort, paired with an attitude that has been suggested to us on a daily basis, that we have the right to some me time. I actually like see shirts like this, and like mugs, and like my journal, the me, the my. That's really rising in our society, isn't it? Especially to women, especially to women. Because many of you are multitasking. Many of you. It's the job, it's the relationships, it's the spousal relationship. For us young mamas, it's caring for kids. It's lots of things. The capacity is pretty big. So we're suggested often, you need that me time, that you-ness. Ah, that's tricky stuff. And are we willing, no matter, um, to fully, no matter how uncomfortable, to embrace what has been handed us? Or do we turn and pick up the temptations that pacify us. How many of you pick up your phone, this is a challenge, as soon as you've got a quiet moment? You don't have to raise your hand. No, no. <laughs> That's quick, isn't it? It's easy to pacify. It's easy. That's why. Because it does things for us. It, it is our imagination. It tells us a story. <laughs> it entertains us, like a show or a movie sometimes. I mean, there's a list of things that what are we so quick to grab and not engaging fully what's in front of us? <clears throat> Some of our under te other tendencies that can happen in the midst of trial. We're talking about going through things. Um, this might not be easy for everyone because none of us are looking to suffer. Like, oh, wake up in the morning and what's the day going to look like? Well, I'm looking for suffering. <laughs> It doesn't look like that, does it? We're saying, I want a really fun, easy day. And those are blessed days. He is there in those days. Don't, I don't want to doubt that. I don't want to push that aside as if it's less important. Those sweet, sweet moments. Looking back at Corey's life, were those not sweet moments sitting around the table with her family and hearing stories and beautiful meals? Those are gifts. But let us not devalue the trial. It's just as valuable. Some of the other tendencies we might have is complaining. Oh, we're allowed that, aren't we? Some relationships allow that a little too much. Um, talking about what we think we deserve or long for, what we should be having. <laughs> Brie, I'm going to use you as an example. So Brie had an encounter with a tick. As you know, she's pregnant. And of course, that made us all nervous because we're like, oh, no, you're pregnant, the tick. Um, big deal but the first words we used were that's unfair it's so tiny how would we ever find that in our hair that just that's unfair why is that tick so small just that feeling you know that we're like we can do that with big things can't we like we can start to choose that someone else's life looks better i think another tricky one is envy is that not one of the biggest lies we ever believe is that someone else's life is better than ours 
That is a lie, and I'm going to call it out right now. That is not true. No one's life is better than yours. We have to believe that. So I'm going to hand two truths. Two truths that we really, really need to cling to. One is who Christ is, and one is who we are. The first truth is that he is unfailing. We sang it in the song. We heard it from the passage of Joshua. He is redemptive, forgiving, and good. He is just. He is triumphant in the battle. You guys, this one I cling to all the time. In the midst of the battle, we really think that we've lost. You know, it comes on so thick, and it comes on so heavy, just pushing on our shoulders. We have to believe what sets us apart from the rest of the world is that we know the end of the story, that we know there's eternity. And I think we need to really cling to that, that the triumph, um, that he is triumphant in the battle. He is all-knowing. Has anyone noticed I have a cold? Can you hear the sinus problem? Right away, what was my first response? I felt desperate. I said, oh no, this cold is coming on. I'm going to be speaking, singing. Lord Jesus, heal me. I you know, got a little desperate. Oh, my throat's so sore. I sent out you know, texts to friends and please pray for me. I need this to go away. Ah, uh, he's all knowing. He knew exactly that I was going to get sick right before this happened. You know, that, that's him showing himself one more time. In my weakness, he's made strong, which is another element we'll touch on. He is all-knowing. He knows you're going through the trial. He has not forgotten that it's there. He's not forgotten about you. And that he is careful. We struggle here, which is why we have a tendency to grab other things. Um, we have this weird thing I think as children of God, where we, we sometimes think having faith, we've got a misunderstanding of safety. Does, does that make sense to some people? I know that when I became a mama, certain risk-taking things about me kind of started going away. Fear tried to enter my, my mind and my thoughts because now I had people to take care of. The number one thing that you think of right away when you have those babies is what? Keep them alive. It's the first thing you can think of. Feed them. Keep them alive. Keep them safe. Keep them alive. That's all you can think of. I mean, we're riding on a ride at Adventureland. I'm such a nerd. So we're on the ride with the big bars that come down. And Jeb, our middle one, he's kind of a little guy. He met the height requirement. It, it's supposed to be safe, right? And Joe's all about it. So Joe has had this amazing ability to keep his risk-taking level super high, where mine has gone down like really low. Well, we're on the ride. The entire time, I'm so scared. I'm yelling the entire time, hold on, Jebediah, hold on. I mean, through the whole ride, I'm just screaming just my one son's name, not the other. He was, he's fine in my mind, just the one. I'm like, what's wrong with me? I get done, I'm just in a panic mode. Then the best part is you can go afterwards to see your picture on the roller coaster. And I'm like, Joe's like, nice panic face. I'm like, I'm shouting Jeb's name the whole time. Oh my goodness. What's wrong with me? Wouldn't you know that, that he's our biggest risk taker, Jeb is? Oh, I just love it. When Joe and I first got married, um, we had to take the Taylor Johnson personality test to see if we were compatible. Well, I know, I just, that makes me giggle too. I was like, well, yeah, let's see. So we sat down, we sat with um, the man who married us. Uh, we were getting married at Central Reform Church and they have, that's where Joe grew up and they, they need their minister to marry you. It's part of the deal. Um, so we went ahead and went and had counseling with him, marriage counseling, and he said, so um, you both are off the charts on risk-taking and adventure. And we both smiled at each other like, yeah, right on. And he's like, I'm not gonna suggest this marriage. And we looked at each other and we were like, yeah, but God does, you know, he does. He's got a great plan in store for this. Not only were we madly in love, that's the easy part, right? We're madly in love, but we saw the adventure in front of us. We saw the ability to take up even trials because I think that's another fascinating part of the take courage is be strong. I think that that's a gift. I think to be able to endure hard things for long periods of time, 
It's really, really powerful. The next we're going to move on to is the second truth. And, and that's who we are. Scripture says that we are made more than conquerors. I want you to ask yourself if you view yourself like that. We are made more than conquerors. And we must have a great resolve to believe that he is who he, who he says he is and that he is stronger within us than anything else in this entire world. Greater is he that is in me than he is in the world. I think that we need to remind ourselves of that on a daily basis because it can come like a flood, right? Those moments. These truths are vital to our faith because it is here where we stand. On Christ the solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand. What kind of house are we building here? We want one that's going to stand strong for a really, really long time. And it will be made evident in the midst of our need because all responses and actions will be built on that. I'm going to say that again. These truths are vital because it is here where we stand and it will be made evident in the midst of our need because all responses and actions will be built on that. I'm reminded of a story. Uh, Joe and I spent a year at Uplift Mountain in Colorado. Some of you are familiar with that. Bree lived there for a while and worked there too. Um, it's a very pivotal place for Joe and I in our faith and our walk, how we've been mentored and how we pursue mentoring and encouraging others in ministry. And we were there to live, able to live there for a year. And we were asked to come there from our friend Dean because he was going through a trial. There was the first uh, tragedy or death ever that took place on the mountain. There was a group of cyclists that had gone out after a storm and during the storm there was lightning and one of the kids got struck by lightning he was 16 years old his name was Landon and he was dead immediately and this was tragic it was tragic and Dean fought and fought and fought and he tried to resuscitate him for I think, half an hour 45 minutes he just wouldn't give up and they had come back to the mountain everyone had come back up and started calling the parents in and counseling the kids that were with and right away when he told his wife, Heidi, her first response was glory. Those were the words that came out of her mouth. Glory. Glory to the Father. Glory because he called his child home, one that was ready. And what challenge, because our response is always, no, 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 no. I didn't want that. That's not good, and that hurts. It's always our tendency, but I think right here, in that moment, what will be our action? Will we be Joshua? Yep, get him rounded up. My response is love. I'm going to round up. Here we go, leading the people. Um, there was a, a story that I read. It's a book called Mimosa. Some of you have read it. I try to hand it off as much as possible because it's another one of those books that have changed my life. Um, it's the beautiful cover with the butterfly. It's written by um, a missionary from the early 1900s, a woman named Amy Carmichael. She was an Irish woman. She grew up in a Christian home and uh, had always wanted to serve the Lord. And she went to India to work with people there and she had this amazing encounter with a young little girl named Mimosa. They had offered day camps and week camps to share Christ. This is a, a dominant Hindu really, uh, religious area. And very looked down on Christianity. So she uh, was able to journey with this family for a little moment. And they had all converted and followed Christ. And Mimosa, in a very swift moment, had claimed Jesus as her Lord. And from then on out, had only ever endured trial. It's hard to hear stories like this because you see such a faithful heart. She didn't have the written word of God. She didn't have a Bible. She didn't have Christian community where she had women encouraging her and friends encouraging her. All of her family had chosen to reject her because she had made some societal choices 
that she was then looked down upon. See, dowry was very, very big at that time, and you needed to show your wealth at all times. So your gold bracelets and bangles, earrings, you would never show up in public without these adornments. And she chose to sell them so that she could feed her children. And she worked really, really hard. She labored all the time, and she had an alcoholic husband whom she also took care of. But she constantly turned her eyes to Jesus. She constantly, in the midst of every single struggle, gave praise to the Lord. In one of her many trials, she even lost a child to sickness, and her family rejected and wouldn't come and visit. All these things just pressed on her, and pressed on her, and pressed on her. And she remained so loyal. She remained so faithful and loving to the Lord. Um, I was going to share just one quick thing. I might just pass that. Um, I think we long as well to identify with so much loyalty to the Father. See, she had, she had committed herself to Christ. And I think in our Christian walk, some of us have been able to do that really young. Some of us did it later on in life and chose to follow Jesus. But we have pockets that still don't belong to him. Um, sometimes they're fear pockets. Sometimes they're um, just identity things that we really want to stay us. Um, but the loyalty to the father that Mimosa had really challenges my heart. Um, It's also um, a place of rest. I think that's something that was really unique about Mimosa is that she chose to just rest her heart in him because she knew she had nothing else. The food was not there. The comforts of life were not there. The relationships were not there. The encouragement was not there. None of it. None of it was available or accessible to her at any day, any time. Even people were falling away from her with death. And she continued to choose to be loyal to him and to love him because she knew and she heard when she was a child that he loved her. Noah's Webster, 1828 edition. Us homeschool mamas take a lot of pride in this edition of the Webster <laughs> because the definitions are different, by the way. He defines courage as bravery, intrepidity, that quality of mind which enables men to encounter danger and difficulties with firmness or without fear or depression of spirits, valor, boldness, resolution. That's a word I cling to a lot, resolve. Patience to bear continual suffering. This is hard for us. I think patience is always really tricky. I admire my dad the most for patience. Um, with someone with such a high level of perfectionism, I think some of us that have perfectionist tendencies tend to be on edge because we see the imperfections all the time. And we want to call them out, right? We were just talking about this. Like, oh, that's wrong, that's wrong, that's wrong. Um, let me fix that, let me fix that. The energy really stirs in us. But my dad has this ability to not only be a perfectionist, but be surrounded by grace and patience most of the time. It's pretty amazing. Um, uh, the, next, the next definition is encourage. This is where we get to hand it over to others. To give courage to, to give or increase confidence, emboldened and inspirited. I absolutely love that word, emboldened. I think it's beautiful. <laughs> think of something blossoming and becoming so vibrant and how it changes our environment to hand that over to somebody else in our home we have one of my favorite artists is an artist named Nikki McClure she's from Oregon and she does art with an exacto knife so she takes a black piece of paper and then she cuts out the art so it's like negative art I was going to bring the piece and I forgot but she's got one entitled encourage and I love it so much because you see a man working out in a wheat field and who's coming but someone with a bucket of water. 
And I love how symbolic that is because this is the powerful change. The person isn't coming to relieve them from their task. It's really hard for us when we see someone going through something hard, we want to take it away. We don't want to see others hurting. We don't want to see someone going through a trial or a struggle. But really, what's our job and encouragement is to not take it, but to hand them something to get through it. Ever been detasseling before? That's like the most grueling job. I can't believe they give that to kids. I went out when I was 14, and I came home, and I said, I think that might be torture. Like, that was the worst day of my life. I had rashes all on my skin and cuts from the corn, you know, and just the heat, because you have to wear as much long clothes as you can because of the corn rash. And we started at 5 in the morning, and we worked till 5 at night. And I think I got like $4 an hour, and I got home, and I told my dad, I said, I'm not going back. That is torture. That is I even might have said, I think I know what the slaves felt like. <laughs> but that image of struggle, something difficult, you know. But to think of the times that we can hand words, words that empower us and encouragement. You've got it. Not, oh, I'll take it from you. You've got this. This was chosen for you. Or to hand that bucket of water. Here's a drink. Press on. Task isn't done for you yet. Trial isn't done for you yet. Um, I think something that is really important that even though we might not understand another person's struggle, I know, I know some of your struggles in this room, you've shared them with me as you walked through life with me. Some of you have had loss um, of a spouse or child or a friend or a sibling. And, and loss seems to be the one that gets us. It's there for a purpose, that teaching and that lesson. Um, it's not always easy to identify with someone what they're going through, but it's okay to walk with them through it and not have all the answers. You need to be encouraged in that way. I remember, uh, speaking of adventurous times, one time I was riding the Greyhound bus. These are things like my parents didn't know I did. So I'm going from, at this point, I just come from New Orleans, and I was riding a bus from St. Louis to Minneapolis. Uh-huh, uh-huh, anybody know that kind of ride? All right, yeah. It was cultural experience all over the place. I was 19 year old with my friend Wendy. And we're sitting in the back and these guys kept kind of harassing us a little bit. I mean, we're young, short girls. And yeah, maybe looked vulnerable, I don't know. And uh, they said, uh, so where are you from? Where are you going? We said, actually we're heading back to Bible college. And um, they said, oh, Bible, huh? You know the Bible? And they kind of teased us, kind of taunted us a little bit. We just ignored them, ate our apples, just, you know, went about our business. And then one came up and started talking to us. Um, he was from a really, this was a group of young black men that had grown up in project areas. And they all had a story. And there was one that really needed to talk, wanted to talk with us. And it was the struggle of faith. How can I keep on with a God who has done what he's done? I said, ah, I don't think those are the right words you need to be choosing. See, it's a lot about how we choose the perspective. It's, um, it's maybe not asking the questions why. I think there's room for that sometimes, but I think it's more about clinging to what I do know that's true instead of clinging to all the what ifs or why this. Because that is a spiral that's going to send us clear into a pit, isn't it? Because that it starts to exclude him. That starts to exclude the Lord, and it excludes our praise See, it's when we adore him, it's when we worship him that we're filled. But as soon as we start to back away and reject, and start to ask the questions why, and start to ignore him and put our eyes on self, then we start to miss his presence. You wonder then why people struggle with depression or why people struggle with anxiety in those moments. It's because our eyes aren't on him anymore. <clears throat> During that time, the, the young man was sharing about how he was laying in his bed one night and his brother, someone had crawled in the window and his brother was shot to death in the bed with him. And that this was their, this was their lives. And they said, that's where we're leaving. We're trying to find a new life for ourselves. He says, and it's constant. He says, and you can't understand that. And he deemed me as a rich white girl. I'm not, I am white, but I'm not rich. Well, <laughs> because I went to college, you know, I think that that seemed successful to him. I said, you know what? I don't understand that. 
And I didn't grow up like that. But you know, I've got my own story. And I've got my own struggles. I've got my own share of sufferings. And I said, there'll be more to come. For us to believe that there's not more for us to be stretched in that, we're kind of maybe deceiving ourselves. But I said, Jesus does. I said, and that's where I cling. I said, it's that woman that grabs a hold of the hem of his garment. It's just enough. It's just enough because she had her eyes right there to him. She wasn't clinging to her own garment, was she? She wasn't huddled in a corner clinging to her own self. There she would have not had hope. And it's there that she would have stayed discouraged. And there her faith would dwindle. But it's the one who grabbed a hold of the garment and said, this is where my hope lies. I'll keep my eyes here. I'll keep adoring and worshiping here. Philippians 3.12 Philippians 3.12, I press on, if so be that I may apprehend that for which also I was apprehended, Christ Jesus. Watchman Nee, I consider myself a student of Watchman Nee. He's a missionary from the 20th century, absolutely my favorite writer. I've been reading him for over 12 years. And um, he's, he's very revolutionary in the, the shift of the church in China. And so, a very pivotal man, he says, he talks about how God has the suitable place for us, the place where we best grow, and conditions that draw us closest to him. We sometimes, or a lot of times, have ambitions to serve him elsewhere, or aim for goals that are not meant to be obtained for us. This is where envy and jealousy can creep in. We then must remember that God's purpose for us goes back before we knew him. Isn't that wild? It is his foreknowledge that determines our circumstances before we were born. Ni nee says, God never does a thing suddenly. He always prepares long, long before. So there is nothing to murmur about, nothing to be proud of in the calling of God. There is also no one of whom to be jealous, for other people's advantages have nothing to do with us. Wow. What do you mean, I can't get there? We're told that, aren't we? I think we're actually a little too success-driven. Well, look at that other person who's got it going on. Keep your eyes on them. Make sure you are just like them. It's all over the place. We're constantly tempted with that. When we look back over life, we bow and acknowledge that all was prepared by God. So there is no need to fear. We have missed something. We have this assurance is true rest. It's like a deep breath. It's almost like someone can relieve us and say, that's all I needed. I almost needed relief for you to tell me that. That's it, just to rest in him? That's my place? Mm. A lot of us know the story of Job. We've taken many, many lessons from Job. Um, but I think something that has just recently struck me about him after his trial, after trial, after trial of, can we say it, things he didn't deserve. We kind of see it like that, right? Like this honorable man, he had all the treasures, all the glories, all the wonderful things, and loved the Lord. So why him? <laughs> Why did it happen to him? It was in the very end of the trials that Job had an awareness to rest in the Lord and to say, it's okay. Because this isn't, this isn't my own anyways. But it's that rest that kind of changed perspective for him. <clears throat> we all have a tendency to get troubled when things go wrong. The nerves start, the what-ifs, playing all outcomes, including other percep others' perceptions. Ooh, that's a good one. Okay, here comes the situation. This is, I am hugely, hugely guilty of. I have a tendency to not take a lot of time um, to process things for myself. I identify a little bit with Patty in that because I care about what others are going to do. So it's crazy. In my own trials and in my own struggles, I immediately think about others. Well, well they're going to have to go through that. Oh, that's going to affect them poorly. Oh, they're going to be so sad. Or maybe they'll be upset. It's, it, their perception of what you're going through 
is not for you to handle. But we must remember and engage that God chose this world to be our arena for his plan, the center of what he has set himself to do. Psalm 40, verse 8 says, I delight to do thy will, O my God. One of the mysteries of such a fierce description of what we're called to take up is that it actually requires of us patience, weakness, and humility. It requires from us to take what he has. Joe often teaches about the middle voice. It's basically um, the concept that all good is received from the Father into us, into our lives, and then we live it out. So here, and we, I think we understand that as Christians, that we in ourselves are not good. It is him who is good within, and it is him who makes us new and can make us righteous in his sight. But um, it is, in order to receive the courage, it requires patience on our part, weakness on our part, and humility seems the opposite doesn't it it's kind of i'm back to those like t-shirts that people are wearing i see them all over the place and i'm like ah, i gotta think about that the recent one i saw that said slay the day that one bothered me a little bit i think because it says i don't feel encouraged by it I mean, it's one thing for like you to come up to me and say, good job, you got this. You're doing a great job. Awesome going through that. Awesome working hard at that. That feels like, yeah, thanks. That kind of gave me more strength. That gave me the courage. That's what that means. There's like this interwoven, beautiful thing that happens from heaven to us, you know? But it's when it's like, slay the day. To me, it suggests like, like this brutality of that we're in control. And I just don't like that view of what it means to be a fierce woman. I, a fierce woman is one who sees her father and sees her father only. Not one who's got her eyes on herself. Remember that this is a relationship. I want us to get back to that. All the character traits that the enemy tries to work to make us believe are wrong and unattractive because he thinks humility is ugly. He thinks weakness is wrong. When are you going to get over it? Right? These are things that the enemy says to us. We, we believe that it's wrong to come into church with tears in our eyes. Just like Patty was sharing last night. I can't fake it one more time, she says. I can't go into that church with a smile on my face. Because the enemy was trying to steal her heart and tell her that it was wrong that tears were there for mourning her first husband and that she was struggling. That's such a lie. But that it's beautiful in the Father's eyes. He says, this is where I get to work. This is where my glory shines. This is where you're changed. It is in our full weakness where Christ's power can be fully revealed to us. Again, remember, this is a life of worship and gratitude. Uh, one more thought from me. <clears throat> I'm saying me, not me, by the way. N-E-E, -E. his name is Watchman, me. It's the nasal. Then there is the price of patience. Quick verdicts and impatient decisions have little to do with the divine light, which is given to those who will wait upon God and wait for God. Wow, I'm going to read it again. I actually even wrote the words wow right here. Isn't that funny? <laughs> like I was typing it out, wow. <laughs> Then there is the price of patience. See, there's always, there's always a cost. There's a cost in this relationship. There's always give and take. When we talk about the marriage relationship, is that not the closest one that we've encountered? Uh, it's constant give and take. Constant laying self down, laying self down. It, it's going to cost something to love someone else besides yourself. Nee says, then there is the price of patience. Quick verdicts and impatient decisions have little to do with the divine light, which is given to those who will wait upon God and wait for God. 
um, my dear friend Valerie and I, we often share what we're reading, and she shared an amazing thought from a book entitled Get Lost um, by Dana Gresh, which is actually like prepping you for marriage, right? Right, so it's, it's like pre, if you're looking for a spouse, has all these amazing character changes. I think they're all really addressing like, you need to know yourself a little bit, and you need to kind of set that aside. But loved this quote. While you are resting in God's strength, be thankful for your weakness, because it's the very place his strength will manifest. I don't know about you, but resting is is this thing we can't get down. We're like not good at it. And I think we fill a thing and call it rest. You know what I'm saying? Like I'm just gonna go rest and go golfing and then go, and then go swimming and then I'm gonna go ahead and um, barbecue. Okay? And then I'm gonna have some people over and then I'm gonna prep for tomorrow with my lists. Um, I think the idea of rest is just saying, not me. I surrender. I'm laying it all down. It's hard, when, especially when we're task-oriented, because tasks can fill the day and fill the space and really make us feel like we're accomplishing great things. Like, got the task done. That was a meaningful day. <laughs> But really, rest is saying, I find my place in him and him alone all day long, all the time. And I lay it down. It belongs to him. I have three children, uh, Cash, Jeb, and Ren. And um, Cash and Jeb, when they were little and they were babies, were just perfect. I mean, like, always good and didn't cry, and sat in one spot and played or looked at books, always quiet. I took them everywhere, just these darling little babies that were so easy to be with all the time. Boys, by the way. I don't like this whole boys are this and girls are that, because then I had Ren, who is a girl, and just blew my mind how she could be. I couldn't believe how engaged she was in things and the intensity that could come out of her and the way that things needed to process with her and the high energy and how she constantly threw my control out the door. And man, that was a struggle for me inside. I thought, she's, she's messing it up. She's messing up the food. She's messing up the table I set. Look, she just rearranged it. Ah. Oh. I was missing what was happening in her and what's stirring in her and my role with her. See, I, I desperately, desperately needed Ren in my life <laughs> because now I'm okay with the little messes and now I'm okay to just let her be creative and actually watch her really grow in these tasks that she's actually becoming really good at. She actually really does know how to wash the dishes. She actually does know how to do the laundry because she likes it, you know? She has her own little broom that sweeps the floor and she feeds the animals. She got the clothes off the line the other day by herself and gathered the eggs. I mean, she's five. But she's just got this thing in her that just wants to go. And I think, what a blessing. Why was I trying to manage that little person? You know, she's so amazing. And then I started praising the Lord for her over and over again. Because I would sit and do dishes and say, Lord, can you make her um, a little more, you know, meek? That was one of my favorite words. I'd pray for her over and over again. And finally, the conviction came so strong. He says, I didn't make her like that. Stop it. Stop controlling her. That's not who she is. I've got plans for that fierce side of her, because that's exactly what she is. <laughs> and that courageous side of her, because that's exactly what she is. But mostly, my favorite thing that the Lord has shown me about her is she is loyal. And that is so admirable. She's taught me so much about being loyal because I know that she is loyal to the Heavenly Father, even in her struggle. <laughs> Another perspective about rest, this image that God gave me, because I long, I long to know him more. Remember, we're here together because, yeah, the food's really great, and you all are really sweet, and it's fun, but really we're wanting to grow in him. 
We want to know him more. We want to know how to live life more for him. Well, leave it to my dog to kind of bring the truth. Um, <laughs> oh, he's so faithful, the Lord. Beloved Gertie. She's mostly German Shepherd, and she just loves us. If anybody knows anything about German Shepherds, they are incredibly loyal and obedient to the master. So, and they're a learning dog, so they're constantly wanting to serve the master and learn how to better serve the master. So they're kind of known for being underfoot. And they knows a lot. They need to have contact all the time. She's incredibly smart and really able and really strong. I mean, I've seen this dog take off across our pasture and get a rabbit and just, you know, there goes the rabbit. And I was like, whoa, whoa, she's on it. Just kind of like, you know, dog. She's got the teeth. She's got the growl if she needs to have it. She's a dog. She's also got these instincts that we've, you know, make sure we train. That's our job is training her. But it's the moment when we get ready to wake up in the morning and we go outside the door and we open and how she's ready and waiting, just waiting with her tail wagging so patiently. So as we go outside, she lays on her back in full submission, waiting, belly up. And it struck me the other day, oh, that's supposed to be us. We're supposed to be rolled over, showing the most vulnerable state that we could ever have, handing ourselves over. See, Gertie's still able at that time, isn't she, to attack the rabbit, bite us if she wanted to, growl. You know, she's still able, but she has chosen full submission. She's choosing full weakness in that time. And I'm just going to say to us, we need to belly up a little bit. We need to reveal our vulnerable place to the Lord, because that is where he's going to do the great works in us. It is mysterious, isn't it? That uh, the most vulnerable position is where we're able to receive the master's love the most. Because when she receives that love in that very moment, specifically from Joe, Oh, her day is lit. <laughs> so here's the words for us. Rest, rest, rest. Take courage, take courage, take courage. Be brave, be brave, be brave. And resolve, resolve, resolve. For those that you don't use that word often, it means you've decided. The decision's made to follow Jesus, no turning back. Like I said earlier, every bit of our faith has a cost. This faith will take all of us. When we gave ourselves to Jesus Christ, I don't think we knew the fullness of that. We thought it was just like burning our CDs that were like heavy metal and maybe not watching that show anymore and definitely not swearing. So like here we had all these lists of things like don't swear, break up with the boyfriend, throw the CDs out or records for some of you. You know, we're like, boom, Christian, got this down. But really, huh, he wants it all. He wants it all and it never stops. It's daily, but remember it's in love. James 1, 12. We've been walking through James at our church for a while. We walk through books for a really long time. And I love it, because then we just have spots to dwell. But I'm going to leave you with this. Blessed is the man who perseveres under trial. Because when he has stood the test, he will receive the crown of life that God has promised to those who love him. Blessed is the man who perseveres under trial, because when he has stood the test, he will receive the crown of life that God has promised to those who love him. One of the times um, Joe and I have endured four miscarriages. None of them were ever easy. Um, my body didn't handle it very well, and I ended up in the hospital a couple of times. Um, and it's just a miracle that I can stand here and be a mama and uh, be a good friend and a loyal daughter to the Lord. But it was one of those times that a friend came to me and she said, how, how are you enduring? How are you getting through this with not <laughs> turmoil? I said, because I gave my life to Jesus, that's why. 
It's not my own. I'm not the one who gets to choose, am I? It's back there. I don't get to choose this, but what I do get to choose is my response. I will worship him. I will praise him, and I will love him. And I want that to be very real in my life. That's not a front. I want that to pour out. Joe uses a quote, when the, when the river runs low, the rocks will show. And my hope and my prayer for all of you is that if your river starts to run a little bit low, <laughs> that the rock that's there is the one that cries out to the Father and says, hallelujah, glory. Can you pray with me, please? Lord Jesus, our King, we call out, we cry out. Even if it's not a trial, you're so worthy. Even if we're not needing courage in this very moment, we know that this is part of the story, that this is a story you lived, Jesus. This is part of the love relationship that you have with us, where you continue to put us in places to grow us, to stretch us, and make the soil of our hearts so good and fertile. You put on there whatever you need to put on there. We welcome that, Jesus. We welcome you into our lives for change. I know that today I don't want to walk away the same. I want to know that you're making me new every day, all day long. And I thank you for friendship and love that we can hand each other that bucket of water when some of us are in the field cutting the wheat by hand. Let us not try to take that from each other because there's good things to be had there, but walk with each other in it. I thank you again for revealing yourself to us and that people can walk away with good thoughts and good words and challenges, Lord. In your name we pray, Jesus. Amen.